Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, to introduce Theo. Um, you know, people usually start these sort of things off with uh, guest speaker needs no introduction. Well, Theo does need some introduction and a little bit of background to him and his doing since his beginnings in Cape Town, uh, having been educated in the Cape before going into the Navy, and a long, illustrious naval career followed. Now, uh, you may be wondering about the surname, Honorable, and it may ring a bell or stir something in the depths of your mind. His father was a famous artist, cartoonist, by the name of Tia Uer Honorable. Hands up those of you that remember those wonderful, wonderful cartoons. I think you do too. And in fact, uh, Marsha and I have been fortunate to see some of those ir original and wonderful preserved cartoons. And there used to be a newspaper that we as kids in the 1940s used to get, it was called Die Gongspan. And, and in there were the running cartoons of Jakos and Volt. And you remember Adun Sala? All those wonderful cartoons. Well, that was, that was Theo's father. Let's give his dad a great <laughs> And we grew up on those wonderful cartoons. Now, Theo's pretty famous as a naval officer. He wasn't always a submariner, because A, at one stage we didn't have any submarines, and you know, the countries that did have lots of submarines weren't, weren't willing to share them with us at that particular stage of South Africa. So Theo came up as a naval officer, I won't say as an ordinary naval officer. He was in surface ships, and he had experience with a number of different navies around the world, training and, and advanced training and specialized training. And you may know or may not know, he's going to give you all the details, but we didn't enter as a nation into submarines until uh, the government of the day decided in the late six, or the 60s to go ahead and get some submarines. Theo's going to fill you in with all that. And he then entered into uh, the diplomatic world. He was a naval attaché. But again, I don't want to preempt what he's going to be telling us, but he has had a long and illustrious career. He's now happily retired in Neisner. So let's give a very warm welcome to Admiral Theo Honnett. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for being here. I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about me, I'm going to talk about submarines. Just to have a few notes. You know, one day we were in a terrible storm on the surface in a submarine, and um, the junior officer on board was the officer to watch. And it was such a storm that I didn't want to go. We were running on the surface you know, to get to a certain place. And uh, uh, it's a dangerous place to be on the top of the submarine's fin in bad weather, and one has to be actually uh, secured with uh, safety straps. Um, so I lay down below in my bunk, which was nice and comfortable. I was reading my gunnery manual, it was Louis Lamour, but gunfight in O.J. Corral. And, uh, and here the officer watch came down, dripping wet in his far with the gear. And I was lying in my jeans and my t-shirt. And he looked at me and he said to me, sir, what is the difference or the similarity between a motor car's hubcap and a submarine captain? He said, I don't know, tell me. He said, they both do bugger all and catch all the shine. <laughs> So, um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna stop at twenty two seven. Uh, because uh, it will take too long to wake the rest of you up with a novel for after that time. Um, I'm going to cover, firstly, why uh, did, uh, the South African Navy get submarines. I was very much, I had spent 10 years in surface ships and I specialised in the UK as the Principal Warfare Officer of a frigate and a navigation specialist and I served in a frigate in that post and, and loved every minute. And then somebody mentioned they wanted volunteers for France and for Daphne. I said, well, that sounds interesting. <laughs> so I went and discovered that Daphne was a submarine in France. <laughs> so, so I'm going to just say, speak briefly about why did we buy submarines? And uh, do we still need submarines? What have we got now? What does the future look like? to give one sort of the big picture. Um, are there any former or extra divans there tonight? Here we go. Well, you all remember we, there was an, an embargo, an oil embargo against Rhodesia and the port of Pyro was where the, uh, the tankers, oil tankers arrived <laughs> and delivered oil that went to Rhodesia. And uh, the South African Navy at that time uh, had the French, the South African 10th Frigate Squadron and the British 7th Frigate Squadron. And they always had a couple of ships in Simon's time. And um, those ships in Simon's time went up to Mozambique and they blockaded Byron. And we were obviously not happy about it, but we found other routes for getting oil to Rhodesia overland and so on, so it wasn't a crisis, but we warned the Brits then and said, don't try and do that to us, you are going to have a problem. And then we bought submarines. Uh, a bit of a problem there, and no one would sell us submarines. The Dutch were interested, because there was a strong anti-apartheid movement, and they were true to the word. Uh, the British we spoke to the Royal Navy, they were kind of keen, but also they were under pressure from uh, the European nations and so on. Uh, and they also said it would take seven years to train us to use submarines. Uh, we looked at the Germans, also there was a problem, and the Americans were quite keen to sell us the barbell class, the last of their diesel submarines. Um, and they were nice boats, uh, but uh, that also fell through. At that time, I was in Flag Lieutenant to Admiral Dema, and I had the, the project report and uh, attended the meeting with the Chief of the Navy and the Americans to negotiate a contract to start a submarine service. But all came to naught. The French came along and said, Of course, we sell you a submarine. And we'll train you people two years. One condition, training is going to be in French. So, learn to speak French. Yes, it's as simple as that. Uh, Marsha, where's Marsha? There you are. Stand up, Marsha. Let's have a look at you. Marsha was part of the project at that time. And she was, uh, and we lived in the same apartment block. Uh, and. Uh, Marsha still looks the same. She hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so we bought submarines, and no sooner did we have, it took us two years. I'm not going to get the long story of training, but the French, the training was very well organized. It, they, the submarines were delivered six, six months apart, uh, so, uh, and I was in the third submarine. At this stage, I want to tell you briefly a story about the Royal Navy Admiral, uh, probably during the war, just after the war. Uh, in the Navy, we have a bit way of sending messages and like telegrams, and it's like signalese. You want to invite someone for a drink, you say RPC, which is request the pleasure of your company, and the reply is WMP, with much pleasure, or MRU, much regret unable. 
and so on. But the signals had to be short and sweet. In those days too, myself and the ships, we, as single officers, we had to live on board. We were not allowed to live ashore. The ship was our home. Uh, and so we didn't have a washing machine or a laundry on the ship. And Mr. Slami and Simon Sun used to, when the ship came into harbour, wait for us on the quayside. Uh, and then I handed in my bag of washing, and the Slami family then did our washing for us. I still spoke to one of the Slami sons recently, and he was seven years old with his dad to come and fetch some washing. Okay, so um, the captain of the ship on their return to harbour uh, sent a message ashore to the naval base, base please arrange for Admiral's woman to be on the quay on arrival. <laughs> Followed up by a second signal which says, to my last, between Admiral and woman, insert washer. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is in the book uh, by C. Broom, it's called Make a Signal. It's quite a rare book, I do know somebody who owns one, but there are lots of these wonderful signals uh, that we have. Well, um, when we came back from France, they taught us Wonderful scheme. Uh, spent two years there. The day I arrived in France, never having been uh, to sea in a submarine before, um, I was a surface ship officer. We had just had command of a minesweeper uh, and and reported to the submarine base. And they said, "You're joining that submarine tomorrow morning, and for the next three months, we're moving from submarine to submarine." In French submarines, to so you can get the feel of this. And so did first three months. I was at sea all the time. When the submarine came into harbour, I jumped on the next submarine, and off I went again. And with exciting times. Uh, and my favourite spot to sit in the submarine was on the uh, the garbage bin that had a lid on it in the control room, so I could be out of everybody's way and I could watch what was going on and I just sit there quietly on that tin and I was soon had the, the nickname in the submarine the Commandant de Poubelle <laughs> <laughs> Commandant de Poubelle which is the captain of the gas chain <laughs> so after two years training and the threat to the the potential threat to the RN, it was, uh, it was said amongst ourselves, but it was never done formally, of course. The French and the British sent out, the RN sent out under command of um, Admiral Clayton, who's flag off the fleet two, or FOF two. He came there with a, a, a couple of ships, a replenishment ship, and two escorts, and a nuclear submarine, attack submarine, came to exercise with the South African Navy. Uh, and we exercised on both sides of the, of the country, out in the Atlantic and up the coast. Uh, and before we went out to exercises, they discussed how they used ships to put a screen in front of the, the convoy, the ship that was being escorted, uh, and, and how they could put the nuclear submarine up ahead of the screen of the convoy and that would transmit on its sonar, and so we wouldn't be able to get through. So I was a question to the admiral, I said, Admiral, what, what do you do if we actually do get through? And he said, not possible, my boy, it won't happen. They never, ever detected the Daphne submarines. Two of us, uh, Woody Woodburn was the captain of the other one, and I was the uh, Captain of the other boat, and to everyone, to everyone's amazement, and including our own, yeah. uh, the nuclear boat was a bit of a joke because it actually transmitted on sonar, so we knew where it was all the time. We could intercept it sonar, um, and it was a disaster for the RN force because they could not find us, 
And the reason for that being that on the our east coast we have a warm ocean current, the Gallus current, and on the west coast we have the colder Benguel current, and these two currents mix around the southern parts of our coast. And the submarine can hide between layers of water. Next time you have a cup of tea or coffee and you pour milk in afterwards, you'll see the milk just sinks to the bottom you have to put a spoon in to stir it. And that's exactly what happens out at sea. It's not coffee, but it's salt water. And the salinity, temperature, and density of the sea creates layers uh, of, of that specific, which affects the speed of sounding water, which, which can deflect uh, or absorb sound. And I want to say that this I had a helicopter, we were we were at periscope depth, the radio master talking to the helicopter and they, they're ducking so around us and they said we returned to us should be wasting our time, we can't detect you. And they could see us. So it became a major problem for anyone else, not for us. As one time we sat on a layer of cold water at about 200 meters down and turned off everything. And we just sat on the on the denser water and we trimmed our tanks and we sat on this layer of cold water for 92 hours. It's about four days. Wow. And uh, it was uh, stunning. Okay. So mariners love that kind of weather okay. because they can't see our periscopes. <laughs> so that's not bad weather, that's good weather. That's a Daphne submarine, running on the surface at about 10 knots. Uh, the front is... Oops. There we go. That's the front of the submarine. That little bump there is actually uh, a sonar set. If one of those same sonar sets at the back of the third. And at the stern of the submarine, there are four torpedo tubes. And in the front of the submarine, there are eight torpedo tubes, which, and they were always loaded. That means we carried 12 torpedoes ready to fire. We didn't carry relays, there wasn't space on board. Here. That's on our return voyage from France. It took us six weeks from Toulon in France to uh, South Africa. We had stops on the way to give the crew a bit of a rest. Uh, that was taken from a Shackleton Maritime Patrol Day. I'll show you a picture of one in a moment. This is an interesting picture. Uh, that is in a concrete bunker built by the Germans during the Second World War uh, in Lorient in France. Uh, they still had those concrete bunkers, uh, bunkers and they still use them because I can't destroy them. They've got three meters of reinforced concrete, could take a direct hit from a 500 pound bomb at the time. The only way they could attack the submarines was having these tor torpedo bombers. Uh, torpedo bombers uh, fly in and launch a torpedo into the entrance of the... And that is the day, this particular day, August 1971, when the uh, submarine was commissioned, handed over to us by the French. <coughs> and really why I'm showing this, and this submarine's name at that time was Johanna von der Merde. She literally her name was changed to Asaka. But you will see, right up top there, our sailors had climbed up the wall somehow and had painted our submarine's name on the wall. I'm sure it is still there. It's, uh, it's right in the front of the submarine is the sonar again, which I'll say more about shortly. Um, that is just a drawing and a mash of things for you, and I don't think mean that. You know, the very first day I went on board a Daphne submarine, before just going to sea, one of our officers from one of our other submarines walked me through their submarine. And I was stunned by the, the uh, complexity of it. 
I went home that night and I said, I am the designated captain of the ship. And I can't see myself getting all this. It was just too much. But uh, after nine months training, it was actually a piece of cake. Um, and the, the, I decided at that time, the only thing what one has to do is to do every day's work properly. And don't go to sleep until you know that day's work almost off by heart. Because the pulse mark was 95%. And if you've got less than 95%, then for the average for the course, then you had to rerun a course for these submarines. Uh, and our submariners were selected by the National Institute of Personnel Research. We were all volunteers, we were all evaluated psychologically and, and physically. We, they didn't want anything special, just to be normal. Everything had to, be, had to work. Uh, most of us were okay. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not going to go on about the so the submarine had 80 tons of batteries on board. Uh, it had two propeller shafts. It had two two G diesel generators. Uh, batteries, diesel generators, electric motors, torpedoes, the officers' quarters, senior ranks' quarters, junior ranks' quarters and all the things inside the fin of a submarine. That's much better. You cover it up with plenty or whatever. Is that my voice doing that? Uh, you don't have to stand so close. Uh, yeah, just a bit there. Okay. Uh, I will speak some more about this famous by the little, little sonar in front here, in the bow. The officer there is sitting on top of the snorkel mast, which one can raise and lower to the height that one wants. Uh, the small mast, when the submarine is at periscope depth, um, you could go to the if you raise the small mast, which is an air tube. And these, the swimmers who use a little pipe to breathe when they're swimming on the surface, that's the same principle in the submarine, which is the valve that prevents the water from coming in. Um, Those little things that look like windows, they're not windows, they are navigation lights. It's an emergency antenna. It's a ring going flat out at 14 knots on the surface. Now, people think that submarines are little things. And everyone walks around crawling around and climbing through little holes all over the ship. <laughs> submarines in fact are big. This submarine is a, is a small submarine, but it's a thousand tons. It's 57 meters long, it's almost 200 feet long. Uh, it could stay at sea for 30 days. It had a crew of 50. Our senior chef was 21 years old and our junior chef was 19 years old. They prepared three meals a day for 50 men. So three meals a day, for 50 men, that's 150 meals per day um, they had to prepare. So for 10 days, that's 1,500 meals. And for 30 days, that's 4,500 meals. Those two youngsters, did, and we ate well. The food was good. There's a man standing next to the sonado. Now that is a big sonado. That was a long range. Uh, it could hear uh, ships out uh, hundreds of nautical miles. It went how noisy the ship was, of course. But a quiet warship would pick up at about 20 kilometers. Um, we once picked up a, a, a ship that was uh, on our equipment, on our equipment, there was a ship that was very noisy. And I said, well, let's go up and have a look and see what it is. It would probably, probably be a tanker or something. Got to periscope there was nothing. And this noise was there all the time. Next day, every now and again, every time we went to periscope depths, nothing. The third day, the tanker came over the horizon. So if he was doing, let us for easy sums, if he was doing 10 knots, which is slow, he'd be doing 240 nautical miles in a day. And we're looking at 720 nautical miles in three days. 
So that's when we heard him first, three days away. It gives some idea of the potential of that sonar. I love that sonar. Um, I will say something about how I'm just a picture. That was the most difficult part for me, was changing from a surface ship mentality, where we had an operations room manned by people, several people. We had a, an air control radar, a helicopter control radar, a gunnery control radar. We had a long-range search radar, we had a navigation radar. Uh, we had people manning plotting tables and reporting to the bridge all the time. Uh, and we, we made a lot of noise with all our radar transmissions, electronic ones. When I got to submarines, we, we were not allowed to transmit on anything. Um, we didn't even talk home unless we had to in an emergency. We had to send a check signal once every two days, just to make sure that no, we are still alive. Uh, but uh, we didn't transmit on sonar, we didn't transmit on radar. We spent all our time listening to things coming in. And I'll give you an example of how we knew how far something was. Imagine right now a car driving past in the road. That car's his bearing, his compass bearing, would change quite rapidly. From there, goes up the road, and he goes away. Same thing with the ship. The ship is close to you, or speedboat or whatever, and it's close, you'd hear him over there, and then he would move along. Uh, and then, so, counting the revolution, we also figured out how far he was, because he traveled a certain distance in a certain time. Uh, the, same, the same car that goes past here, listened to from George, It'll just be there pointing at nice and it won't be there won't be any movement at all. What I'm saying is that when something was far away, the bearing was steady. When it was close, the bearing moved. Unless he was on a steady bearing, which was the collision course. So we had to alter course time to provoke bearing movement and so on. Uh, and we picked ships out a long way out. Um, then that little sonar up on the nose. Up on the bow, that was a high frequency sonar that couldn't hear so far. So, if we had picked up the sound on the long range sonar, we listened. Okay, is he close or is he far? Check with the attack sonar and say, on this bearing, have you got something there? Uh, yes, of course, he's close, he's near. Otherwise, he's nothing there, you know, he's actually a bit further away. That is the basic principle of the underwater. Now you can see the fin of a submarine. And there is the, uh, see, the captain walking up, climbing up, goes up through a door there to the top of the fin. Those are navigation lights and not, um, are not windows. That's a little sonar for something else. We had lots of different sonars for different purposes on board. And they all did it through intercepting and listening. And then analysis. You can see that even though that's a sort of relatively small submarine, it's not, it's very big. The fin alone is about two and a half meters. Uh, this is. Now that happens to be me sitting there, uh, sitting on the small block, uh, going into harbor. Uh, you've heard my story before. A friend of mine looked at the picture of me, a lady friend, a German lady. And she looked at the picture, it was another picture, but anyway, and she said, who is this? And I said, that's me. She looked at it, and she looked at me again, she looked at the picture of me again, she said, what happened? <laughs> so, didn't invite her again. Yeah, something interesting. That ship has a white line, a white stripe on its waterline. And the helicopter on the stern uh, doesn't have a tail rotor. It has a double main rotor, two main rotors. Um, it's only the Russians have submarine uh, helicopters like that. This, helico this uh, helicopter carrier of the ship, the Russian ship, look, it's got three or four masts. Four masts. And those masts are for electronic intercepts. 
Uh, and they are what we call ELIMS trawlers, electronic intelligence trawlers. This uh, ship was off the Trans Cape Coast, quite close in, picked up by a Shackleton Maritime Patrol aircraft. I was sent along there to go and have a look at this thing. And, and he was, I thought he wasn't doing anything other than just hanging around. So I surfaced next to him. You know, the submarine surface. And then you can see all the people around the bridge gathered there like a bunch of mosses. And, <laughs> and I shivered myself for just a little while, a couple of minutes, made sure they'd seen me, and then dived again. They left our coast. They were uh, transporting ANC members from who trade in Russia to the Tronsky at the time. They're putting in the shop. And that's what that was all about. That's a, a, a little story I thought quite interesting. That's a Shackleton Maritime Patrol aircraft. Uh, I painted that for my journal as a midshipman. Uh, I must tell you the story. It's a joke of myself and, and my friend. Um, when the Shackleton, when I prepared to paint this Thing that my training officer said, Bishop, and your sketches in your journal are not good enough. I expect something better from you, your father being T.O. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a tactics exercise, and all the ships were on, and the Shackleton aircraft, every time the Shackleton came, the bridge like I grabbed the binoculars and looked at it. <laughs> and I rushed, and I made notes. Then they came from that side, and there and say so this thing all the time and the second in, second in command of the ship walked over to me and he said are you thinking of buying one of those now? <laughs> so I said no sir I want to do a drawing for my journal uh, he said that's nice you like to go for a fight yes sir I do. so when you got to a harbour you found everything and I was told on next morning 5 o'clock the airport, airport then the port there where the airport shackles off, shackles off was winter time traffic exercises and I, little lonely me walking across the tarmac towards the hangar, another guy came towards me. And it was a young Air Force candidate officer. And I put my hand out and I said, Honeyball. And he put down and said, Snowball. <laughs> <laughs> it was Ken Snowball. And Ken Snowball and I became good friends. Uh, he died a couple of years ago. Marsha, do you remember Ken Snowball? No, it's a very nice guy. So we became, he was a navigator in the Shackleton. White stripe on the waterline. Russian. What else? <laughs> Look at the vase with all the little trinkets on it. But there's something underneath the ship that, that I say is a bit suspicious. Let's have a look at it. There you go. Torpedo tubes and a, and a giant sonar. Now these, these trawlers used to hang around uh, the Scottish uh, ports uh, where the where the RN submarines, the nuclear submarines there, and they would wait there and then track the submarines as long as they, as they could. Um, and then, uh, but they were equipped. And I think if, they, if our submarines had broken up, their function would have been to sink those submarines as soon as they leave our That's a clever idea. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> That's what a ship looks like when you make it go bang. That's, um, you get cheeky with the submarine. That's what happens to you. Uh, a torpedo hit. And this is uh, a different ship. Uh, we fire a torpedo just to go underneath the ship. And uh, the magnetic field of the ship disturbs the magnetic field the magnetic uh, sensor in a torpedo and it explodes. And that explosion lifts the ship up out of the water and drops it back and the ship breaks in half. Every time a coconut, they break in half when you fire. And we've done many uh, firings in, in peacetime to see how quickly. When the ship breaks in half like that, it's gone within 10 minutes. Just the arrangement in the fin of the submarine, I'm not going to go into it, but there's uh, too much uh, radar, if we need, 
Whether I'll use it peacetime in fog if you have to get to a port or there is a bit of a problem and you can use it. I very, very seldom have to use it. Uh, an attack periscope, uh, a search periscope uh, with a radar detector in it, um, an ECM electronic countermeasures mask for intercepting, uh, a whip aerial for HF and, and antenna, an IFF snorkel mast. Um, yeah, there's the other sonar on the stern. And this is where we've climbed up to get to the bridge from down below in the submarine. Is that a lock? Uh, it wasn't. Yes, it was a lock. Yeah. Yes, it had a hatch, hatch at the bottom. Hatch at the top and hatch at the bottom. It had a, yep. Yeah. Um, a hatch at the bottom and it had a hatch at the top. But when you're on the surface, or oh, when you're even snorkeling, uh, the lower hatch would be, no, would be shut. On the surface, both hatches would be open. Okay. We even had our own wine label. <laughs> That's a submarine that guys as an elephant. <laughs> well, it's only something about our, our wine label. That's actually to show our submariner's badge at that time. It was a Laurel Crown and a submarine. Uh, the Daphne class submarine were after the mythology uh, uh, Greek uh, goddesses. Uh, Daphne was the name of the first French submarine, so they all subsequently got uh, Greek mythology uh, names. Uh, Apollo was in love with Daphne, and he chased Daphne all the time. And uh, Daphne's father, the god whose name I forget, didn't like it. So he turned Daphne into a laurel tree. So Apollo went along, and he... Um, broke off two branches and he, and he wore a, a laurel crown to show, his, to show his love for Daphne. So that's what the origin was. The uh, trident is power from the sea and the submarine was a, a Daphne submarine but it was a loose fitting. So one day we've got Chinese or Russian submarines you can just change the submarine but to try and keep the laurel crown to show your eternal love for death. Mm -hmm. I'm getting close to the end now. I, I want to just say in a, back to the big picture. It's an Albatross maritime patrol aircraft. <laughs> it's a painting. That I saw. This is what I'm new, sorry. 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 The height, right? Yes, yes, that's right. The Albatross had two push propellers. Uh, I flew one of them at one stage, and uh, and the colonized aircraft. The, the reserve officers, reserve pilots, private pilots, joined the Air Force Reserve. They mainly flew those over the weekends doing maritime patrol work. All the nice girls love a sailor. Yeah. And this is uh, these are our new submarine so made in Germany. This is just the inside uh, the wardroom, the officers' quarters in the Daphne submarine. Uh, that's uh, Woody Woodburn uh, and uh, Steve Stead. I wanted to say something I spoke about the, between uh, Admiral and woman in Sir Washer. In the uh, publicity for my talk today, it was this, the last surviving submarine commander, me. Between surviving uh, and submarine, insert first. What I'm saying there is that, that there were three of us the first submarine captains. The first one was was uh, Commander Jan Bederman. The the second submarine's first captain was Woody Whitburn. Uh, and I was the first captain of the third submarine. Uh, Woody and, um, 
and you are paying one, they are what you call on eternal patrol. Um, and I am the last surviving first captain. And if I can't take my toys with me, I am going. <laughs> to say something about that. Yeah, I'm running. Do we really need submarines? I haven't spoken about the Angola War. We were very, very active in the Angola War. We took special forces uh, to all the ports in Angola. We sank Cuban and Russian cargo ships in harbor alongside the special forces. We delivered the special forces outside the harbor, and the special forces guys would swim in. Uh, underwater, or, or, or kayaks, uh, and they would do as much damage as they could on the coast. The railway network in Angola runs southward from Luanda, uh, close to the coast, to coastal towns. Uh, so we had a lot of fun um, with special forces blowing up the bridges along the way. Uh, there have also been operations. Um, the van on the toy guy who was captured by the Angolans ashore. It was a submarine operation. Um, we blew up the fuel tanks in Namib Harbor and uh, a few other places. We sank a few ships in harbor alongside. It's better to sink a ship alongside in harbor because they, they couldn't move it and they couldn't bring another ship into under. So we, and the exploits of the submarines and the strike craft in the Angolan War are well recorded in a recently published book. They had to get special permission because all top secret stuff. Uh, you probably might have read it. It's called Iron Fist from the Sea by, by Arne Soberland and, and Stein, I forget his first name. And there they detail some operations that they did. Uh, interesting stuff. That's what the submarine looks like in good weather from the air. There's two periscopes up. Okay, there uh, we always said this pack only had three aces. These are the, the first three submarine, uh, Daphne submarine captains. Myself on the left, uh, Jan Bedemann in the middle, and, and Woody Woodburn uh, on the right. So, all the naughty things we did, I'll just give you just skim the surface of many things. And I want to say, just lastly, do we need submarines? My answer as a submariner is no. And I've written to the Chief of Navy and spoken to the brothers and guys. The situation has changed. Life is what happens while you make plans. And with the new Navy, mostly a black Navy, it's unfair on them to give them hand over sophisticated equipment. We started from scratch with trawlers our Navy many, many years ago. And, and to give these guys really sophisticated stuff to run uh, and, and operate is, is actually unfair. Uh, for the cost of one submarine, you can buy three patrol frigates. They are horrendously expensive. To get a spare part can take up to 14 months in our system and the German system too. The Germans also had problems keeping their submarines at sea. It's heavy on manpower. As soon as the guys get qualified, they get a good qualification, they get a good job outside and they go. There's no, the Navy is my life, the Navy is my career. I want a better job. This is what's happening. Of the three submarines we got, there's one, one that is operational and do well. The submarine isn't half operational, it's either operational or it isn't. Uh, I want to say something just positive about the South Africa. I think they're doing a hell of a good job at the moment. They run the ships well. I had a report from a friend of mine two days ago. I spoke to him on the phone. He said he'd just been to see one of the Navy ships. He said the ship was spotless. The people knew what they were doing. The captain was good in the ship. There was a good atmosphere on board. He said he was 
amazed how well they do the equipment. The problem that they have really is lack of funds to keep the Navy alive. Okay, that, that is their problem. But I think, unfortunately, the black people are natural sailors. Uh, I don't think that they like wearing their uniform, but they don't like going to sea so much. But those that do go to sea, they do a good job. So I can actually give positive feedback on that. Uh, of course, what is pushing submarines to one side is the missile here. The submarine can fire a missile to a target 2,000 kilometers away, and it hits within one meter accuracy. And ships can do it. And, but a, a submarine is an expensive machine, and for our small navy that doesn't have money, they should scrap the submarine. This is my opinion. Now, kill me for a second, but I've said it before. And rather use that money to have a good surface fleet of less sophisticated ships. That's it. Thank you.
may I add something very briefly? I'm uh, very interested in the Russian spy ship. Uh, when I was in the British Merchants Marine as an officer 50 years ago, we had a standing arrangement with the British Admiralty that we were paid unquestioned 20 pounds into your bank account for every photograph of a Russian spy ship that you took while at sea. All you had to do was send it into the Admiralty with a date, a time, and longitude and latitude and your name, and it was in your bank account. Yeah, fantastic. And we also did that. So I, could, I think the whole the network was excellent because um, the, the merchant navy, they had people who had sea all the time. Uh, and, and they go on routes and they see a lot of sea and it's not just uh, military stuff they also on uh, bird life they report the way it's in the sea life and uh, the merchant navy is a tremendous source of information to the whole maritime field any uh, something I've missed you to know about I'm married <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to be anointed? Any questions? I've got one question. Yes, Leslie. Where did you get all those spare ships to blow up when you were practicing with torpedo? Ah. I thought you'd ask me how many people have I killed. <laughs> I said none yet. <coughs> Those, uh, the ships that you see blown up there are and those two naval ships uh, that they uh, could not sell because they like their hull. It would be too expensive to upgrade the hull life. Uh, they no longer complied with international maritime organization regulations. Uh, and they were basically obsolete and beyond economical repair. So they used to sink ships like that. Uh, ourselves also to f in a place where it would be a reef for the marine life. In False Bay, we have SAS Good Hope, I think Frey Start, a couple of ships that are sunk there in selected spots uh, which serve as a reef for, for, mar for marine life. So it's very successful. And uh, often the, uh, the ship right in the beginning in the storm was a fishing trawler. Uh, Irving and Johnson, if they had a trawler they couldn't sell or wouldn't sell or didn't want to scrap it, you know, they used to offer it to the Navy and say, would you like a target for a torpedo? And every couple of years, you know, a torpedo is quite expensive, it's the price of a small medical. So you just don't find them indiscriminately. So, but we would make sure that our torpedoes worked. Yeah. Why did you please say something about the language that you went to before you went to France and also the people who were running it, the, the Gallops. I, I would like you to say that. No, no, no. <laughs> 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 you know, we got uh, three submarine crews, that's 50 per submarine, plus extras in case somebody fell over or failed the exams, uh, plus the dockyard people, plus the administrative personnel, so South African Naval Base was established in two in France. Uh, and the average age of said my submarine uh, was 27 years old. I was 31, 32 uh, in command. So there were only youngsters and so on. And the married guys had a problem of coming to France for, for two years or 18 months or whatever, how long they had to be there. And they had children in primary school. So uh, the South African Navy, the French Commission, uh, uh, established a South African primary school in Toulon. Uh, and they got two teachers, school teachers from South Africa, uh, who, who taught at the school. I think probably up to standard five, by the Marshall. Do you realize that thing about Wendy Domasser and, and the other girls? No, I don't. Wendy, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nomisa, and uh, husband, they live in Australia. It's very successful business people. Mm -hmm. Leslie. Leslie. 
Gera. The language school at the Gera. Yeah, can you tell us about Gera? Ah, <laughs> this is Gera. After I spent five years at sea in submarines, I commanded two submarines, and then I went away, and I went to the Naval War College in Paris for two years, and then I came back and I was a project officer for new ships and submarines that we were buying at the time. And then I went back to France as naval attaché, and when I came back, I went as the commander of the submarine flotilla in Simonstown, so the three submarines to look after. We had a seven-story building, and every sailor had his own cabin, and we had laundries and dining rooms, and it was very, very nice. You had to treat, you had to, you had to keep your submariners because they were expensive to train. Uh, and you didn't want to lose them. While I was commander of the submarine flotilla, I received a document which was a new submarine project for South Africa. Uh, and that was in the uh, 84, 83. And I had the project, the whole project uh, detail, all the project details, the whole project study. And it was delivered to me and I had to go through it and get, put my comments and so on. And I was told to do, when I was finished with it, to deliver it to the commanding officer of the South African Naval Dockyard, who happened to be Commodore Dieter Gerath, a Russian spy. <laughs> so, years after I left the Navy, I had to go and see somebody up in Johannesburg. It was a Muslim guy, and uh, uh, and for, he said, by the way, uh, Gerard passed those submarine plans to, to us, to him, where they were working. So they, the, the Russians knew about our project before it even got off the ground. And he didn't get off the ground. <coughs> Dieter Gerard was a good friend of mine. Yeah, I knew him quite well. I, he was. He had delusions of grandeur and he collected Persian rugs and expensive paintings and so on. And, and uh, he was up for the money. And he went to the RN, the Royal Navy uh, in the UK, at uh, Manhattan Engineering School. And while he was studying there, he was an engineer, a very good engineer. Uh, while he was studying with the RN, he went to the Russian Embassy in London and offered his services. And uh, chased him away and so on, but he kept at it eventually. And he even had the rank of a colonel in the KGB, in the Russian intelligence service. He actually had a tragic life. He, his, his first wife was an English girl, a very nice person from a very wealthy family. Uh, she left him, and he was with her landed daughter. And the daughter, well, at 15 years old, uh, jumped in front of the train arriving in Fishhook Station <laughs> and was killed. Uh, so I think that, I think, took the name a bit off his rocket. And his second wife, Ruth, uh, was German. He met her at a, at a ski place somewhere in, in Austria. And he met her there and then they got married and lived together. Did Ruth recruit Peter. Yeah, I think that uh, Ruth, Ruth was part of the setup. She was, she was sent to meet him, and he was sent to meet her. Because they got married, because they were operating together. She spent five years in jail. What happened to him? He's living in Fishhook. The people are telling me they see him occasionally. What age? Eighty-ish. Uh, uh, he, I think he's about 84. He was a couple of years older than me, maybe more, 85. I knew him quite well. So he's still alive? Yes, yes. Uh, and when he was in jail, he sort of joined the ANC and he, uh, and he said it was a political cause and it was a political uh, crime that he committed, so therefore he was released. And he was honored by Nelson Mandela for being separated. <laughs> he did 
to go. Now, the, the secrets that he stole, he also worked at the Pets headquarters in the Tanning Division, and he passed a lot of information through to the Russians, to the Angolans, and sometimes we suspect, maybe, that the, the, the Dutoy guy who, who was captured by the Cubans and Special Forces, um, we say we went to that spot twice. Uh, the special forces, somebody took them up there, they went ashore, they lay out in the, in the felt and just watched the base, uh, the place that they were going to eventually attack, uh, and then had them strict instructions not to do the attack, only to observe and return, which is what happened. And then uh, two months later, they sent another submarine. Uh, with the team back again to go where they were, where they had been, to go do their job. By that time the grass had grown and the grass was quite high uh, and no sooner had they got to their waiting spot when the Cubans all lined up uh, with uh, sticks and roots and so on and they walked through the long grass to comb the area. Uh, they they shot two other guys, killed them, and, uh, and caught Van and Deteu, uh, and the others, six of them, got back to the coast. Uh, the captain of the submarine was Peter Keen. I was the commander of the flotilla at the time. Um, he had to pick them up before light. And so he went in, and came light, there was nobody there, so he had to wait the next day, one day extra, I went back again, I said, so nobody there. And Peter Keane said, no, he doesn't believe it, and he did away. And he waited in daylight at periscope depth, and then they saw on the beach guys running there. And then he surfaced in broad daylight and, and recovered the guys and brought them back. Hmm. Interestingly, one of the guys had been shot through the foot. His ankle was shot. And he was the biggest, strongest guy of the group. And the other two guys carried him, or the other four guys carried him. They had gone five kilometers further down the coast. Uh, and when they got him, well, there was a doctor in the submarine for that purpose. Uh, the submarine took the injured man, and then the submarine headed straight up to sea. And there's our replenishment ship, Kaufelberg, was on the other side of the horizon waiting. Uh, transferred the man to Kaufelberg, and the ship headed off. From Arthur's Bay and soon within helicopter range of Arthur's Bay, it took the casualty and took him to, to Arthur's Bay Airport, where there was an aircraft C-130 waiting, uh, and and uh, had flew to Pretoria. So it took three days to get him to the hospital. The submarine from and from Luanda to to Simonstown was took ten days. It took us ten days to get there. 10 days to hang around there and do what you want to do, and in 10 days come back home again. So. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, what happened to the three Daphnis? Okay. The first, the first Daphne was scrapped. Now that we've got, the Daphnis were fantastic submarines that they lasted forever. We never missed a sailing date. We were always on time, we were always on schedule, we always got the job done. Uh, and the Daphnis were kept in service, their whole life was about 30 years, and we had it for about 32 years. The first Daphne submarine was Maria van uh, Um She was sold for scrap. The second one, Emily Hogarth, was also sold for scrap. And the third submarine became a submarine museum, or museum submarine, in Simonstown. And it's still there, uh, but there are political factors, and the submarine is now, it's on the on hard, as I say, out of the water, but it's locked up, they're not allowed, their museum part isn't operating. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a political thing, is that uh, the guy in charge of the flag of the fleet in, in Simonstown is a uh, rear admiral in Shana. Bravo, Michelin. I know him well. He's a very nice guy. He speaks well. He's a clever guy. He had command of a figure. He moved into Belmont House, an historical museum, uh, 
um, heritage uh, house, um, Belmont House in Simonstown, and he took a plot down and he named it Chris Harney House. Of course, the local historical society then was there. The historical society became historical. <laughs> and and Shana was was ordered to take the Chris Harney down, but he never put the Belmont House plot in there. And the story is that he they don't want to recognize the Navy that was there. They said it wasn't a South African Navy, that was a white Navy. South African Navy only started in 1994. So they tend to negate everything before that. Would you mind showing up to us a story about Henry Hobart's in Barcelona? Do you understand William wrote about one of the Honorian declaration for Sam Brayford? Yeah, that happened in, in the June 1972. Rainer was just to get your question, please. Uh, I don't think everybody heard the question. Yeah. Uh, okay, ask uh, to, to recount the story of Emily Hobhouse on the east coast of Dar es Salaam um, and what happened there. I haven't read the report. I was going to do the next follow up operation. Uh, Emily Hobhouse was a new, newly arrived in South Africa, I, just about the time I arrived, so they were at sea when I had arrived in Simon's town. He was sent up, uh, Marshall's husband at the time was the navigating officer in that submarine, uh, and they went to Dar es Salaam, uh, and uh, along the way they stopped Mozambique to go up a creek to get fuel added. They just carried 100 tons of fuel enough for, for 30 days, uh, but it would have been a bit longer and we said they run out of food. They only got space for 30 days worth of food for 4,500 meals. <laughs> they went into a reservoir and the special forces were left the submarine and they went ashore and they created havoc on shore and came back <coughs> innocent. Mm -hmm. the, the submarine had gone closer than she, she perhaps should have. Very close. A lot of gas. Uh, so close that they couldn't dive. It was too shallow to dive, so the state was pitched back with no move. And in the darkness while the submarine was slowly putting around there, waiting for the people of Special Forces to come back, they bumped into a fishing boat with two guys in it. Uh, and um, if they let those guys go, it would have compromised the operation. So they shot them. Hmm. When they got back, um, the chief of the Navy then, Aaron Johnson, didn't know about them. It was a top secret thing at that time by special forces. Um, and then they briefed, I was briefed afterwards as well, besides doing the follow up operation. It was so secret that I had to go meet a general in a hotel in Cape Town in plain clothes and go and meet him in his room, and I was briefed there. Admiral Johnson, Chief Navy, he said, That's murder. I will not allow. My submarines are people who do other people. He said, over oh, my dead body will they have to pick up the phone. The phone chief is very forcing he said, stop this nonsense. Uh, and they stopped me. So I didn't go for the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, point I once said to an army, I said to an army general, yeah, you guys are fighting a war out there in the border, and you're saying the Navy is doing nothing. I'll stop this war for you two months. Two months and it will be over. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, flirty. Yeah. How will you do it? I said, I'll sink a couple of Cuban troop ships. Come in. We went over the horizon, off Rwanda, and out of sight of land, when a, a troop ship comes along, a Cuban ship or a Russian ship, torpedoes, we had electric torpedoes. They were silent torpedoes. They had a range of 12, 12 kilometers, 12,000 meters. So they wouldn't see, there was no 
washed trail, as you see in the movies in the Second World War. They were silent torpedoes, they could run deep, they got close to the target, they honed in on the target. They picked up the target itself, and then it honed in on the target and would go back. Uh, and my proposal, let's, let's see if you cut the Cuban ships. And then the Cubans soon stopped to lose all their troops coming in there and their equipment and they were, even if there were no troops there, just the, the, the supplies, just logistics. Six ships and stopped their supplies going through. And the, the chief of the defense force and the government of the military said, we are not murderers. Our war is to put the pressure on the people on the other side uh, to make them come to the negotiating table. If you start killing people on mass like that, you're going to escalate the conflict. And you must keep it on a limited conflict level. And we don't murder people. So, you know, killing people wasn't a, a good idea ever. Uh, but we did sink those ships that were alongside in harbor, and no one was killed in those attacks. So we put the pit mines underneath them. And uh, on a Saturday night was the best time to go because then the Cubans are partying on shore. Uh, on a Saturday night, you're going to put your lip at mines and they go bang at midnight. And when they come back to their ship, it's sitting on the bottom. <laughs> you couldn't actually see the ship sink because the, it was shallow in harbor, say five, five meters, and the ship had a three meter drop. It just dropped two meters. <laughs> they couldn't take it away. <laughs> Are there any questions or contributions? What, uh, what, uh, how, does, how did the homing system work for the torpedoes and what countermeasures were like that? The torpedo, in the, the torpedo in its nose had a hydrophone. Now, a hydrophone is an underwater microphone. In fact, they had two hydrophones that listen in two directions. Then you'll pick something up on this, on the left hand, left hand one and turn towards it until it gets into the second one and then you'll turn it the other way again. So these two hydrophones kept it so eventually the target would be between the two. Uh, and they could, uh, we would send the torpedo on an intercept course, give it its course and off it went. Uh, and uh, when it got within a kilometer of the noisy target, it would then start homing in its self-steering gear. Nowadays our torpedoes are different, they, they're wire guided. Um, so they leave a trail of wire behind so you can control it. Uh, so therefore you can go further. You can go up to 20 kilometers. Because if you send out a torpedo 20 kilometers, they're not fast, and the ship alters course. You know, your torpedo goes over the horizon and the ship gets away. So if they do alter course and do a zigzag in an area, you can redirect the torpedo. Mm -hmm. Money. I was asking about the countermeasures. Torpedo countermeasures. Yeah. The ships, to counter the torpedoes coming in, they drag a long wire behind the ship with a bunch of pipes. Call it pipe noise maker. The sea dead will go clang, 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 and make a lot of noise, make more noise than the ship's engines and the ship's itself. So when the torpedo gets close, it could pick up the noise maker. And then it would home in on the noise maker. So then they altered the program to the torpedo that once you go through and you do, and you're not um, you're not triggered, uh, then the torpedo will then do a circle and come back again in the direction that the noise maker was traveling, and then get closer to the ship. And, so and then someone else comes with a clever noise maker, and so it goes. <laughs> Um, in submarines, I did a, a couple of months in the Mediterranean exercising with the French Navy. Um, and in the submarines, we had a, a decoy system. We could, through a hat, we could put a, a bombette thing that we launched to sea and it generated bubbles and slowly went up. And it created a, a decoy for the ship sonar latched onto these and they would attack the bubbles and so on while we go the other way. What we found far more effective was that when they were pinging on us, we would um, open the vent valves of our ballast tanks, 
and blow air into the into the ballast tanks, and these the air going out through the open vent valves would create a curtain of bubbles, and under the water pressure, we could dive to 300 meters. That's about a thousand feet. We could dive deeper than H N S Dreadnought, the nuclear submarine. When we exercised with them, they were limited to 250 in the Daphnis. We were given corridors or levels where we operate so we don't, there's no mutual interference. And the Daphnis were always given below the other submarines because we could dive very deep. So we, we would do a curtain of bubbles and everyone would have a lovely time attacking the bubbles and firing the death charges. <laughs> off of and yeah, there we go. Uh, sorry, just want to ask you, all the sort of antics up and down east and west coast of Africa, were the Americans and the British, were they aware of what you were up to, or was it done without their knowledge at all? Uh, when I was naval attaché in Paris, I was invited to a uh, naval officers association luncheon by the French. And lo and behold, who appeared at luncheon was Admiral Clayton, who had brought his feet down to to uh, evaluate our submarines, to see our performance. I went to spoke to him and I said, I was one of them and to attack. And he said, you know, uh, we went down there to evaluate your feet. He said, we've got the shock of our lives. And he ordered a board of inquiry wanted to know why they could not detect our submarines at all. They never once detected us. And then uh, just recently I got, someone sent me a letter uh, a, a document. Uh, at the time, the defence staff in the UK uh, did a study on the, the possibility of invading, sending troops from Britain into Rhodesia. Okay. And they, they replied, they, well, they didn't reply, their decision to the government was that it's unlikely to be a success. And then didn't at all consider it, said forget about it, it won't work. And then they also did an evaluation of South Africa on, on embargoes and so on. And the, it was all those things were possible, but the cost would have been very high. It would be very silly if these submarines sink all the ships along the coast. <laughs> yeah, there was a joke about Pip Wurta and, and P.W. Wurta and all these guys. Uh, the Russians were threatening to come and invade South Africa and, and so on. And uh, Pope Wilton went across to uh, Russia to speak to the president then and, and said, look, you guys, you must, you must stop. You're threatening us. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got 20 jet fighters, mirages, uh, and we'll sort you guys out. And the Russians said, look, We've got 2,000 jet So the person said, okay. So we've got three submarines. You guys chose to ask, boy, are you finished? And they said, well, we've got 73 submarines. And the person said, well, the army side, if you come on the land side, we've got, the, we can put 300,000 men in the field. And the Russians said, we can put two million troops in the field. So, Tuck says, can I use your phone, please? Mm -hmm. He certainly he phoned back to, to his uh, contemporaries in South Africa. He said, look, can we, uh, have we got a place for two million prisoners of war? <laughs> to escape from a submarine when it's underwater? No. <laughs> uh, the Daphne, the Daphne had an escape system? Yes. Uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, fairly, we had an escape system uh, in the Daphne's, but the Daphne's are built for the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean is, is four kilometers deep, 4,000 meters deep, and the Daphne's have to go to 300 meters. And the Daphne's crushing depth was 600 meters, double our maximum diving depth. Uh, so it was generally accepted that the, uh, you can only use your escape system if you sink alongside in the harbor 
and it, something goes wrong, Colin opens the wrong door, or the torpedo doors when he shouldn't, and the submarine sinks. Happened in India recently. Six sailors were killed in that one. They died, the submarine sank alongside in harbor. Uh, and, and the guys drowned in it. Just before we went over for our submarine training, the French lost two Daphne submarines, the exercises who sank in 4,000 meters of water. I didn't go on to that, but there's a fault in the snorkeling system. The air tube has a valve at the top with electrodes. That if you lose depth, <coughs> something down below, and, and the snort mass is you lose depth, these little electrodes that touch the water, closes the circuit, and that head valve is kept open by air pressure, 25 bars. It cut off the air pressure, vented it, and the, and the valve, the lid inside, shut. At the bottom of the tube, uh, there was a chamber where the snorkel was in. And, and in bad weather, the water splashed into the snorkel mast anyway. So you've got, and in very bad weather, you've got a lot of water splashing, and it splashed into, down into the control center, there was a, a box, a drain box, and they watched the water through the glass top. If it got too much, then they would stop snorting and give a diving signal and shut down everything. What happened in uh, the French submarines, that that system on the top of the snort mast failed and it stuck open. The submarine lost depth. The water rushing down the tube, that in that, at that bottom chamber, there was another, a second lid that one could shut manually. You pulled the bar and this big thing like that went clunk and sealed the water uh, and the problem was solved. What happened was that the water came down there with such force because they had lost depth. And when the guy pulled the lower lever, the thing didn't go clunk because the water came down, hit the bottom and came up. It held the lid up so the lid couldn't shut. And the water went into the submarine and the submarine, of course the water goes by the ventilation junction that the air would go to the diesel compartment, so it got heavy by the stern, and then climbed down the stern first, and imploded at about 400 meters or so. And there were two crew, now, remember Vic Hull of this? Yeah, he was on that submarine that went down, and then he, he got off and he go do something else, and then someone went off to sea, and, and it happened while in the snorkeling and it was lost. Now that happened to my submarine as well, but we were alerted to the problem. The, and the, and the, the weather was fairly calm. The top system failed and the bottom system failed as the water rushed down. Fortunately, the engineer officer and the second in command were both qualified control center supervisors. They had been alerted about this potential system and they saw it happening and they blew immediately and they got the top of the the, the mast, the snorkel mast, out of the water, so the water stopped coming in. We, uh, our bilge pump could pump 13 tons an hour, uh, and it took on the surface 40 minutes to pump out the water that came into the submarine at that time. We had something like 8 tons of water which shipped in a matter of seconds. But fortunate. Now, another strange submarine floor. Uh, who I trained on previously. Uh, Flores, I mean, his captain was Jean-Jacques Lez. He was a guy from Alsace, half German, half French. His submarine had the same thing. But they weren't as lucky as we were. They managed to save the submarine, but they got a lot of water in at the main proportion. They lost power. Uh, and they were hanging on the surface with the the nose sticking out and the stern underwater. Uh, and then they had to, they got, the radios were working and they had to get, get towed in. So it was close. Uh, I think we could do this the whole evening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I think 
I really uh, want to thank Thea for this tremendous talk. Uh, I feel like I've gone for days, actually. But all good things have to come to an end. And the only thing I can think of in response to this is a story I read in the Reader's Digest when I was about nine or ten or something like that. And it involved a, a defense system they developed in Texas for, for combating German U-boats in World War II. They apparently used to put green paint on the sea. And then when the submarine went out, the green paint would go over the periscope and they'd keep climbing to about 10,000 feet and they'd shoot them in the aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> Really, it's a terrific talk. Uh, I also must add one thing, and that is that on the 17th of March, on the Sunday, we're going back to Sunday, 10:30 uh, for 11, I think, like, yeah, we're going to have uh, Professor Curtis Marion coming out from Northwest University. He's on sabbatical, uh, University of Cape Town, and he's a world authority on clinical point and early modern humans. And he has this thesis uh, on the eating of shellfish and particularly omega-3, which uh, he claims uh, helped to make human beings, early modern humans, uh, more intelligent in the past and, and, and contributed to, like, to human evolution. And this is why your mother always said you've got to eat fish to be clever. So that's going to be quite an extraordinary event. Um, and there will be advertising, but I thought I thought it might be appropriate for you to be, give advance warning and put in your calendars for the 17th of March, on the Sunday morning at Goose Valley, as I said before, at the veranda, where we have the Rotary quiz on Wednesdays. Tia, I really want to thank you for the most entertaining and, and, and enlightening talk. It was everything I thought it would be, and I'm really, really <coughs> happy to be here. Thanks again. Yeah.